Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming for the talk. I hope you have enough energy. This is the last talk of today sessions. And uh, yeah, I'm Shivanshu. I'm a founding engineer at Cygnos. I'm also a CNCF ambassador and maintainer and contributor to Open Telemetry. And uh, we have Jonathan here, who is yeah, who is the founder and CEO at PuffPod. So let's get started. So, first of all, um, let's see what is the outline of the talk. So, firstly, we'll see why network observability is important and uh, what is eBPF and how you can use it for net network observability. What are the tooling available uh, for to facilitate network observability via eBPF and uh, understand the architecture of open telemetry network. We'll dive deep into all the individual components and uh, agents that Open Telemetry Network uses. Finally, we'll have a demo and also how you can get involved. So let's see why network observability is important, what problem does it solve, and why use eBPF. So modern distributed systems are hard. They are hybrid, meaning they are running different Kubernetes clusters across different regions, sometimes multi-cloud. And they are heterogeneous in nature, meaning there are collection of VMs, bare metals, and Kubernetes clusters working all together. And it becomes challenging to uh, figure out some problems, especially at the network level, because low-level telemetries are not present by default. Your logs, uh, spans, and traces does not give, give enough context on the network layer. Even if you are using uh, service mesh, uh, for example, if you are using Istio or Envoy, sometimes you need to correlate the Envoy logs to get the flow of the logs and flow of the network request. Fundamentally, it's very complex uh, to troubleshoot the network-related problems. There's limited visibility into network performance. Um, there's ineffective detection of anomaly and security threats. So for example, if some of the ports are open in your infrastructure, you wouldn't know. And, and, and if there's some traffic flowing through it, if there's, not, there's no network observability, it would be very hard to figure out those problems. There's lack of insight into user experience and application performance. There are compliance and audit challenges. And uh, it is very hard for network cost analysis. So for example, in a sidecar pattern, if you're using Istio, there is extra overhead of sidecar. But if you're using some low-level tool, which is gathering all the telemetry from the Linux kernel itself, uh, the cost is low, but if you are not monitoring your network, then figuring out the network cost analysis is, is hard. Also, network failure at the cloud provider and external vendors API is not easy to figure out, but if you have network observability, it helps. So what is possible with uh, network observability? So it gives you enhanced security posture. It helps in optimizing network performance. It also helps in diagnosing packet loss, uh, resolving high latency issues, user device identification using the MAC address and the network interface. You can get some protocol specific information like TCP metrics, UDP statistics, and also the flow data, and deep visibility into uh, third party API failures. So why use eBPF for network observability? Uh, EPPF provides low overhead monitoring, so you don't have to run a sidecar. Instead, you can just run a single agent, which is collecting all the information from the kernel. It's minimal, and it has uh, efficient data collection. It provides deep visibility into kernel and application behavior, access to kernel events and uh, application-level insights. You can filter out the events by programming the Linux, Linux kernel dynamically. It gives uh, flexibility and programm programmability and real-time data and high-frequency metrics. It gives a rich telemetry, and you can use that for correlation. So what is eBPF? Um, if I may ask how many people have heard about eBPF? 
I think a lot of people. And how many people are actually using it in production? Quite few, but it's nice that people are using it. So on a very high level, this is how EPPF works. It extends the Linux kernel. Um, you already know that it's extended Berkeley packet filter, which means you can intercept your syscalls and dynamically program to collect and filter all the process, all the syscalls that are happening, and filter that out and put into an EBPF map. And you can use the collected data in the EBPF maps to do further, further correlations. So for example, if there's a process and um, which is coming from, uh, from, from some socket, and then you can filter out some information from that. So what are the tooling available to facilitate network observability? So there are a bunch of tools, both for applications and infrastructures. Um, IOIZER BCC provides, it's, it's a powerful tool, and it, collect, it is basically a collection of libraries and tools that facilitate the creation and compilation an execution of BPF programs. It provides tooling required for I.O. and network and monitoring. Um, LLM VM compiler infrastructure. It is basically a collection of uh, modular and re reusable compiler and tool chain technologies. It is being used most commonly as a, as a compiler for all the BPF programs. And it contains a robust framework and used for developer compilers. Um, BPF trace is again a high level tracing language for Linux. Uh, BPF, BPF trace uses LL, LL, LLVM compiler as a backend um, to compile the scripts to eBPF bytecode. So let's understand the open telemetry network architecture. Here we have, in this particular example, two nodes where some applications are running, and you can see that there is kernel collector, KTS collector, and cloud collector installed. And all of them are sending telemetry to the reducer component, which is in turn sending all the collected telemetry to hotel collector, which is acting as a gateway. So let's see how these different components are working. So first component is kernel collector. It's usually deployed as a single agent per node, basically as a daemon set, and it collects all the low-level telemetry using eBPF. KTS collector is a deployment uh, which collects all the events from Kubernetes API server, so it's, it's basically monitoring your Kubernetes API server and collect, collecting details like uh, creation of pod and deletion of pod. The cloud collector uh, agent is again deployed as a deployment, and it gathers uh, so it uses cloud provider SDKs, and it uh, gathers the events from cloud provider itself, and some metadata, for example, AWS instance ID, or uh, zone, region. And the reducer finally collects all this telemetry and uh, enrich the data to do correlation between all the telemetry that is being collected from different components. So let's dive deep into all the individual components. So first is kernel collector. So let's first take a look at the diagram. Here, this is basically a data flow diagram inside a kernel collector. How would your telemetry would flow from the Linux kernel itself to finally to the reducer? If you see, there are eBPF programs which are loaded, which are basically the probes for collecting DNS requests, TCP connections, CGP, uh, CG groups, and process events. So they are basically monitoring all these things. They are also collecting HTTP metrics and TCP handling. The BPF handler uh, is responsible to manage the cycles of eBPF programs. It loads the BPF code, attaches the probes, and handles the data collection. It's, it is also responsible for perf events and filter. Now, all the data that is being collected goes to the data collection modules. So first is data, DNS request collector. It filters the DNS-related uh, information. Similarly, the kernel, CG group, and performance polling events. And then, it is, uh, then basically, there is a cloud metadata collection unit, which 
collects AWS. So currently, it is supported for AWS and GCP, and it uh, collected collects the metadata from AWS and GCP as a cloud provider using the SDK, and it also collects data from Docker and Nomad. This curl engine, and then the agent flow, and then finally, this output you can output that into a file or to a reducer. And this is basically the information around uh, every individual components that is there. So I can probably skip that because I just explained that through the diagram. Now this is a sample log where you can see it is coming from a kernel collector and you can see that what is the node name uh, and what is the instance. Basically this is collected from the cloud provider, uh, cloud provider agent and it is giving us the details around the instance itself. Let's take a look at Kubernetes collector. It's a relatively simple agent because it's, it contains two, uh, basically when it runs, it contains two containers. One is KTS Watcher and KTS Relay. The responsibility for KTS Watcher is to basically watch the Kubernetes API and collect all the events, and then it sends all the data to KTS Relay, which is in turn sending that to the reducer server. Cloud collector is, we briefly touched up touched upon it. So it basically iterate over all the network interfaces using the cloud provider SDKs. And it retrieves uh, network interfaces and regions and metadata. It handles throttling and API errors. The cloud collector agents also schedules metadata collection, handle, handles error recovery, sends data to ingestion pipeline. I think if you are able to see, it's basically how the telemetry, telemetry would flow through the cloud collector agent itself. So now let's talk about the reducer component. Please, Jonathan. Thank you, Shivanshu. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. So I'm Jonathan Perry. I uh, founded the a network collector project, and I'm a current maintainer. So uh, this is a different diagram of system components. Uh, you can uh, see I'm going to talk about the reducer. The reducer is a critical component that receives data from the kernel collectors, as well as the Kubernetes and cloud collectors, analyzes it, and output metrics into the OTEL collector. Uh, here is an overview of the reducer. I'll start on the bottom. Uh, there's a logging core that takes all the logs that the other cores of the pipeline want to output and then prints it to the console. And we did this because printing to the console is relatively expensive. We didn't want those prints to delay data flowing through the pipeline. Um, the logging core also handles internal telemetry. It collects health information about the health of the pipeline itself. Uh, in the next few slides, I'll go through the analysis that the reducer makes from left to right in these ingest, matching, and aggregation core. So let's start with ingest. The reducer receives socket information, but critically, it needs information about the context of the socket. Information about the process, the container, and host it's running on, as well as instance metadata that Shivanshu mentioned, um, availability zone, for example, uh, instance name, information from uh, local container uh, uh, runtime, and information about domains and network address translation. The reducer takes this data and combines it with information from uh, Kubernetes API and from the cloud provider. And what you need to know about the ingest cores is that they are a digital twin of your cluster. And uh, what I mean by digital twin is that the ingest cores replicate state from all of the operating system in your cluster, from the Kubernetes API, and from your cloud provider to create a real-time model of your entire cluster, the pertinent parts, in memory in the ingest cores. So think about it, it, ha it has representations and objects for all the pods, the containers, the processes, the sockets, and so on. And the idea is you can analyze that and uh, create, uh, create the telemetry, derive telemetry from that digital twin. Now, maintaining a digital twin was also really good for performance. Uh, 
Uh, we measured some, a few live systems and found that for every container update that the system received, uh, there were thousands of process and socket updates and hundreds of thousands of socket activity reports. The digital twin enables the reducer to receive metadata only once per entity and keep that. And that metadata is then accessible when you need it to derive uh, metrics. We measured network overhead in several production deployment, and it is usually, you can see, around half of a percent and a little bit over 1% in extreme cases. Now, imagine if we had to repeat the metadata over and over hundreds and thousands of times, we probably wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been able to reach these low overhead numbers. So onwards to the matching core. Network connections have two sides. Uh, and so we would like to combine all of the metadata from both sides, if we have collectors on both sides of the, so of the connection, uh, to a flow object. So all, funnel all the metadata there. The matching core takes the data from both sockets and the relevant Kubernetes and cloud uh, metadata. And the enrichment function, you can find it in, in the code, the enrichment fu function decides what are the different attributes of the flow. So for example, if we have one side running on Kubernetes and the other side is run, is the, of the connection is a managed database, so maybe an RDS database running in your cloud provider, so obviously there's no kernel collector on there, then the enrichment function would take the RDS instance name from your cloud provider. Right? So you have all these data sources, you combine them. This is essentially what the matching core does. So it combines both sides and enriches. Let's see the aggregation cores. The enrichment function assembles the following dimensions for flows. Uh, you can see logical data about the workload, such as the cluster, namespace, the name of the deployment, and so on, and physical locations, such as the host name, availability zone, and region. This, uh, to output all of the flows with all of this cardinality, is way too much. So time series databases today just cannot handle this much cardinality, all the flows in the system. They're in, unable to store it, they're unable to query it, it gets too expensive. So really, you need an aggregation on top of this. We found that there are three intuitive aggregations over these dimensions. Uh, I'll go from the right-hand side this time, um, where you have basically all of the information. This is a pod. So the entities that you aggregate to are pods. If you forget the individual pods, but you still remember the physical environment they run on the availability zone in the region, then you have this middle aggregation, which we call AZ. Uh, and if you also forget about which availability zone the, the pod is running on, then you have what is intuitively an application, right? This logical thing that we deployed. Um, and so now remember, uh, there are two sides to the connection. So there are both the sender dimensions and receiver dimensions. Uh, and you need to s select which aggregation to perform on either side. If you take roll roll, the most aggregated roll up that we offer, then uh, it's kind of this application is sending this data to that application, is the metrics that you'll see. If you take the most granular one, you'll see this pod is sending to that pod for every pod in the system. So every application might have thousands of these. Uh, or you can do something in the middle. The aggregation core takes the flow data, which is the super granular data that we assembled before, and then starts aggregating it to coarser and coarser aggregation. For example, it takes all of the flows between two specific pods and aggregates them. So maybe there were 100 sockets flowing between these two pods, but you just get, after this aggregation step, you get, just get one metric or one set of metrics for this pair of pods, one for uh, latency, one for the number of packet drops, and so on. You can then take all the pod pod information and then aggregate it. Maybe you forget the sender pod ID and just remember the application information and the availability zone. And on the destination side, you still remember the pod. So you get these time series from the AZ aggregation to ID, and so on. Uh, here's a measurement of a cluster with 1,500 uh, nodes. And you can see that uh, on the top here is a fine-grained aggregation, uh, and it outputted um, 20 million data points per minute. And on the bottom is the application-to-application -application aggregation, only output 
1.3 million data points per minute. So 20 to 1.3, there's a huge saving when you have this aggregation, but you lose the dimensions and cardinality. Um, so with that, we have um, your end-to-end -end view from the digital twin to the matching and enrichment and down to the aggregation and output to the old toll collector. And with that, Shivanshu, you have a demo. So let's take a look at uh, the demo. Let me change this from mirroring to So basically, I have already set up the demo. Um, the, so there are, basic, if you take a look at the number of nodes running in my case cluster, there are two nodes. So we can see there are two kernel characters deployed. Oops. So there are two kernel characters which are running on the different nodes. And there's one KRS collector, which is collecting all the Kubernetes related information, the cloud character, and the open telemetry character itself. So let's take a look at the logs for the reducer. And okay, so right now the tracing is enabled for this component. And let me also first try to send some requests. So let me complete the request flow. For example, I have the shoes, place order, and let's make some couple of requests. And I'm gonna delete the reducer and so that we get the initial logs, which are important. Now, if we go and look at the logs, so a lot of EPPF related uh, matrix collection is enabled, and we would see when when the container is ready, we see the metadata coming in. So this metadata is coming from the EPPF Kubernetes collector. We have all the network interface related information. We have the role, AZ, and ID, which is uh, needed for the correlation, the instance itself. And then the, another metadata is coming from the eBPF cloud collector, where we have the other metadata embedded in it. Again, we have the information coming from the kernel collector. And then we would see all the, the trace that's happening in the, in the agent itself. But let's see what is coming to the collector. We should be able to see all the metrics that are being collected from different collectors and enriched by reducer. Let me take a look at the collector logs. OK. So we do have metrics coming in, and uh, we, it is enriched by all the metadata that is being collected as the metric attributes. And if we do the, so for example, this is TCP related information. There's eBPF network level information. Basically, all the telemetry is being collected. And then you can do a lot of. Um, Correlation on top of it to get the overall network view. So we have a demo for that as well. Let's start. Yep. 
demos, sorry. <clears throat> so, um, thanks. Um, the, these demos, first, I, I want to say a, a note about this. These are not open source. This is an old UI that we had. Uh, they're not part of the project, uh, but it, just to show you what kind of UI you can build on top of this type of data. Um, the only vendor I know about this, uh, about that has a solution is Splunk with Splunk NPM. And if you know of other, other vendors, please let me know and I'll include them in slides uh, later on. Um, so, you know, take this not as like I'm pitching you to use this exact thing. Uh, so here you can see um, how you can map out cloud architectures with this because you have you know the role role information which application is talking to which application that you saw a refresh there so this updates in real time you can see here throughput for example between the different components and the idea is here is that this updates a lot faster than architecture diagrams so you can know what's happening in your system in real time this is one of the use cases for this in the other one uh, is how you can debug security group problems. So here you're monitoring an RDS instance. This goes by really fast. Um, on, the e on the Amazon console, we're going to fudge the security group so that they don't allow this port to access RDS. We fudged it up, right? Like if you have an error somewhere in your script, a refresh can show you these SYN timeouts that start occurring very quickly. So you can see kind of connectivity issues in your cluster. Okay, should I do this? Yeah. So how do you get involved? Um, we have a roadmap. Uh, it's on the project. There's a link here. It's just on the repo. Um, and this has a bunch of topics, but these are suggestions. And we're, you know, I'm, I invite you, if you have something that you want to contribute, uh, and, uh, a direction that you think the, the project should go, just engage. This is not a hard roadmap that we need to follow. So to get involved, if you haven't deployed yet, uh, the Helm chart is part of the OpenTelemetry collection of Helm charts. Um, and uh, it's called OpenTelemetry eBPF at this point. We didn't want to interrupt folks using the Helm chart by renaming it to OpenTelemetry Network. So it's still called Otel eBPF. Similarly, um, we're, you know, we're on CNCF Slack. We monitor that. So please hop on, um, ask whatever you need if you have a problem or you need anything, or open an issue on the repos. And we have a weekly meeting on Tuesdays. And uh, here again, you know, there's the Open Telemetry Community repo where you can see all of these meetings. And so you can get a link to join, super easy. Uh, but uh, I didn't include the link or, you know, I have the time here, but just check for the most recent time in case it moves. Um, if I invite everybody, uh, contribute. Just go on the repo if you have something that, you know, if, if you see a problem, open an issue. Um, or you know, submit a patch. So there are kind of two main repos. The main main repo is the OpenTelemetry network one, where you can see the collect. You can, the, it includes the collectors and the reducers. And then there's a build environment uh, that includes all of the uh, requirements to build the system and to, uh, that is in a separate repository, which gets arguably less work, but it's uh, it's still there for you. Uh, and so with that. Um, I'd like to thank Shivanshu for pulling, uh, pulling this off the presentation. And um, thank you all for coming and uh, invite questions. So there's a mic in there. Thank you. We can wait. How memory intensive is the system? Sorry, sorry. Uh, we have uh, an, another qu uh, question there, but I'll ask, answer this one. So, good question. Uh, we've spent uh, a quite a, few, a bit of engineering effort in order to make sure that the kernel collectors and the reducers are both very uh, have very low memory footprint. Uh, we did this uh, by uh, the. If you look at the code, uh, it pre-allocates large buffers in order, to, uh, in order to be able to hold as much as the largest deployments possible. But uh, the code is very careful. We, it's in C++, and we were very careful not to touch that memory. 
So basically, you allocate this memory. It's a huge chunk. But the operating system doesn't actually get pages that that belong to the application until you really need them. So this way, we were able to avoid malloc and freak and the overhead on every, every time you need to process a socket where you have hundreds of thousands of these events uh, while still maintaining low, uh, low memory utilization. So I hope this answers the question. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, super basic question. So you mentioned uh, a lot of the capabilities you can get during aggregation when you have both sides of a flow available. What if you have none of that? Let's say you only have one side. I'm sitting in a Kubernetes cluster, and a socket has come in from somewhere. Yes. So um, the kernel collector collects metadata on, on both directions of traffic, so both incoming traffic and outgoing traffic. So it, even if you have just one side of the connection, you still get almost full telemetry. Uh, for example, you don't get resets on the other side, but you get resets that you see on your side. The, then the enrichment function really shines because you want to paint what that other IP address that you don't have a kernel collector on. So I mentioned an example with RDS instances, uh, but also the reducer has support for this reverse mapping of IP addresses to, to um, autonomous systems. So it would tell you this came from at and this came from Amazon. So you'd know roughly. So you'd have an IP address, but also kind of roughly where it's from if you have no other metadata. Um, the, other, I'll, I'll, the other thing is uh, you get DNS information. So if the side that you have the co collector on made the request, then you'd at least know. For example, if you tried to send to api.stripe.com, You'll, the traffic would be labeled with api.stripe.com. So as you were talking, I, another question kind of popped up into mind. So uh, is there a way to provide maybe a custom enricher? Maybe I know stuff about my own network. Obviously cannot tie into eBPF on like, let's say, a Windows system. But I know what that thing is. I can provide information. Is the uh, enrichment capability extensible? This came up a few times, and uh, there, so the question is, uh, can, can you add information externally about entities and paint them that way for enrichment? Yeah. Uh, this came up a few times as we developed the collector. The, this was too much to, uh, we felt like we didn't have the bandwidth in order to implement such a system. So you could, with a configuration, you know, con file, a YAML file, maybe add that. And we, we didn't do it. If you want to contribute that, that would be a good, uh, a good contribution. I would say that the, the OpenTelemetry network collector can, is not exclusively for cloud native workloads. So if you have a Linux VM, it doesn't support Windows. But if you have a Linux VM, you can slap it on there. If you have a bare metal machine, slap it on there. And it kind of does the right thing. It accesses the local uh, Docker uh, metadata. If it's, if it's there, it accesses instance metadata. And uh, there are also environment variables where you can t override kind of what cluster it's in kind of logically. Thank you, guys. Uh, so I have a question. Did you measure the CPU overhead of the eBPF hooks? Uh, let's say at sustained multi-gigabit transfer rates, like maxing out the 20 gigabits per second link, and, and what's the CPU overhead? Uh, yes, I don't have it available right now. We did measure it. Uh, we found that the, redu the, sorry, the collector was under, oh, now I don't remember if it's half a percent or 1% CPU. Uh, so this was something that we measured and we, we cared about deeply. And we made sure that we measured not only the user space component of the kernel collector, but also the eBPF functions themselves. So we used perf, and I have one presentation where we have the recipe, and we gave it to, to users. Uh, and then they could analyze it and see. Um, right, so, so that's great that you also measured the CPU time of the, of the actual hooks. But one problem that I see, I saw in one slide, uh, you showed the two functions, two kernel functions that you could be possibly hooking. One was send message, the other receive message. So assuming those are for TCP, 
a, a process that's using TCP can pass a one megabyte buffer to the kernel. So TCP send message will see a one megabyte. So that's very efficient. That's fine. And then the kernel will chop, will chop the buffer up into smaller packets later on. But for UDP, that's, that's not the case. Right? An application using UDP and sending megabytes per second cannot pass a one megabyte buffer to the kernel. That's going to be rejected immediately. So what you end up there is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of system calls, right? Sending in, uh, UDP packets at a very small size. So if, if you have a, a kernel hook, an EBPF hook that's hooking UDPs and methods, say, then that's going to be executed, I don't know, 100,000 times if yes. you're actually sending. And then, and then I, like, I have strong doubts that the CPU overhead is going to be less than 1%. And, like, it doesn't seem very likely. Yes, so there are these extreme cases. But if you look at the code, there, there are a lot of these tricks or mechanisms that we used in order to reduce overhead. Um, so you might see that the eBPF code has a per socket counter, and then it only sends messages up to the user space every hundred or thousand reports. Uh, it's a trade-off between how much overhead you have and how much timely is the information that you get. Um, there, um, we've also significantly optimized the overhead of sending this telemetry. So the encoding is super simple, and we made sure that you know, it's minimal. Um, for exa another example is we used perf rings to communicate between eBPF code and user space. And those rings um, are not shared between different cores. There's one per core uh, that the operating system manages. So there are no locks in order to send these messages. So the, there's multiple things that we optimize in order to reduce overhead. To say that you couldn't find this case that is uh, abnormal in, in overhead, I'm, I, I can't say you wouldn't, but I think we covered a lot of the common uh, cases. And if you find something, you know, create an issue and let's work on uh, reducing it. OK, great. Thank you. And thank you. I think we're at time. So let's, let's take this off. Like, uh, if anybody has more questions, like to take it offline. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Harold.